me start. <clears throat> At a certain moment, when you had the script, you had the location, you had your actors, you had to decide, we've got to find a puppet. <laughs> How did that come about? How did you ah, wind up choosing this one? Um, well, you know, it's um, the choosing process. I mean, that's really what directors do. They just choose over and over again until the film actually starts shooting. And uh, when you sit down and say, what is the puppet? Uh, there's a long spectrum. The first thing you think of is one of those puppets in the Discovery store that actually looks like a beaver with the hair and the fur and the eyes. Uh, on the other end of the spe spectrum is um, a sock with two eyes. And it could equally, it could have been either of those scenarios. Uh, it could have been incredibly abstract or incredibly concrete and resembled an animal. Uh, I think what we were looking for is for the audience to never forget that this is a prop. It's just something he found in the dumpster, and it could easily have been anything. Uh, and for them to focus on uh, Walter Black's pain and uh, the man struggling behind the mask. Um, so we kind of went somewhere in the middle and, and wanted a wanted a puppet that felt childlike in some ways, that had been loved and that had been used, uh, that was sort of from a different era that preceded Walter. And uh, we didn't want him to be too threatening, but we, uh, we also wanted there to be an oddness and a quirkiness about him. Uh, and he, you know, there, there, the other requirements were the functional requirements, you know, he has to, his head can't be larger than Walter's, and, and his arm has to fit in there properly, and, um, uh, we really wanted the teeth, you know? We wanted him to be goofy, but um, uh, to have an innocuous quality, but then when he turns sour, to be able to see the sourness in him too. And did Mel Gibson spend time with the puppeteer, <laughs> working out those routines? He did, he did. And, uh, you know, the, the, we were able to, just to, uh, the process of figuring out the whole puppet business, we got to talk to lots of interesting puppet people. Uh, Hanson Company as well were really helpful. And um, he worked with the puppeteer from there, and, and uh, he went to the dry cleaners and did all sorts of crazy stuff with the puppet. And it, it's actually a difficult task to learn how to do that with your left hand. He uses his left hand. Um, you have to only move your thumb. You can't move your hand like this. You can only move your thumb. And if you have a really long speech, you get big cramps going up your arm and sometimes <laughs> massage it. No. Can you talk a little bit about the screenplay? It's an original screenplay. Is it based on any kind of source material? No such material at all. Original screenplay, first time writer, had never written anything before. Uh, he first started writing a novel, and then about halfway through realized that um, the pressure was on, and he to do something, I think, that he, 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 was, he was losing himself a little bit in his novel, and uh, so he decided to write a screenplay. Uh, it had never, when I got to it, it had never been developed by anybody. Nobody had ever changed a word, or no director had been involved. How did you find it? Uh, well, um, my fantastic agent who's here tonight. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, he called me up and said, you know, I read this amazing script uh, that is on the blacklist, which is the uh, list of the best unproduced screenplays. And um, there's another director involved and another actor involved, but if something ever happened to them, I think you would really like this. So that's exactly, exactly what happened. Now, of course, it's a work of fiction, but in what ways are there aspects of it that are clinical, are things that, in fact, people from the field would respond to? Uh, well, with children, for example, in psychology, and especially pre verbal children, puppet therapy is pretty much all they do. Uh, they work with puppets and work with games uh, to try and get a child to, uh, to disassociate themselves uh, with their emotions and put the emotions inside the puppet. Uh, so that's not an unheard of practice. I don't really honestly know any adults that do that, um, but, you know, it's a fable. And uh, the, I think it works well as a fable uh, and, and, and does that have that surreal quality despite the fact that the, the way the film is treated has a real rawness and a reality to it. You know. From the screenplay, was the sort of parallel track of Porter's story kind of always a major part of the, the film? Yeah, there was always two stories, the father's story and the son's stories, uh, son's story. And um, there, uh, you know, there are lots of challenges that come with that. Uh, anybody who's ever made a movie where there's two stories that are happening at different times <laughs> know that uh, balancing that is very difficult because sometimes you want to spend more time in one story and not in the other. And so there's a lot of things that you have to do with the screenplay and spend a lot of time in the screenplay trying to balance that. Uh, but also difficult because um, these two people who are very different are supposed to be sharing things, uh, sharing traits, sharing, visually sharing the screen. And yet, they virtually never speak in the whole film until the end. Um, so yeah, there's a, a little balancing out. Yeah, 
And you wanted us, I guess, to see that uh, Porter was a uh, Walter in the making, or potentially? Yeah, I think, I don't know anybody that doesn't uh, somehow wake up in the middle of the night and afraid that they're going to become their parents. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, as we all know, uh, the severe depression is uh, very much uh, re revisits itself in the next generation. If there's a genetic predisposition to depression, and um, anybody that has mental illness in their family lives in fear of that. And when you started working, first of all, when did you think of Mel Gibson for the role, right, from the beginning? Or? Uh, from the time I first came on, really, uh, you know, we did that thing where we got that list, and uh, he was the first person on the list, and we went to him, uh, there was some trickiness about it, about whose toes we might be stepping on, so I had to ask Mel to make a decision in 24 hours, really on the QT, just me handing the script, and he was amazing. He called back and he said, I think it's crazy, but I like it. And uh, he made the decision very quickly. What kinds of things do you think that he brought to the role that perhaps were surprising for you? Well, I don't know if I was surprised. I mean, um, he, there are very few actors that have these two qualities. The first is he has a wryness and humor. He understands um, the charm of the character. And, uh, and, and I knew he would it, to pull that off brilliantly, the, the beaver, the accent. Um, um, but the other side was, um, it had to be somebody who really understood struggle, and uh, somebody who was willing to go to a, uh, you know, to form a very shameful place, uh, a very raw and vulnerable place. And um, I don't think we see that very often from Mel on screen, but it's something that I know about him as a man. And I've known him for you know, a long time. We've been friends for 15 years. We made a film together many years ago, and, and kept up the friendship. And he's somebody that I spend, you know, three hours on the phone with talking about children are talking about our lives or our families and uh, I knew this was something that would capture him in that place. Let's see if we can get some questions from